A few years ago, one of our historical foundation members, Morel Ray, donated a book titled The Annual Report of the Smithsonian Institution of the Year 1883. In the report, an article is published on the Indian mounds of Berrien County, Georgia. The article was authored by William J. Taylor of Alapaha. In it, he identifies four locations of Indian mounds that were located, supposedly, within Berrien County. Two locations are located north of Alapaha. The Alapaha Mound was located about five miles northeast of Alapaha on the north bank of the Alapaha River in Landlot 328 of the 5th District. The other mound, referred to as the Reedy Creek Mound, was located about 10 miles northeast of Alapaha. In the article, it states the mound was located on Landlot 24 of the 5th District. However, Reedy Creek flows through Irwin County and empties into Willacoochee Creek north of Berrien County. Most likely, the printed report has a typographic error and the probable intent of Mr. Taylor was to identify Landlot 224 of the 5th District, which Reedy Creek runs through. The other two locations are south of Nashville. The Withlacoochee Mound was located about five miles south of Nashville on Landlot 278 of the 10th District of Berrien County, just west of the Old Coffee Road. The other mound location, referred to as the Futch Ferry Mound, was situated about 10 miles south of Nashville in Landlot 415 of the 10th District, about a mile downstream from the ferry. So, what Indian culture created these mounds? When were they created? And what was their purpose? The Indian mound builders were an indigenous people who resided in Midwestern and Southeastern United States during what is called the Mississippian period, which lasted from about 800 to 1600 AD and saw the development of some of the most complex societies that ever existed in North America. In Georgia, the Mississippian period is divided into early, middle, and late subperiods. During the Middle Mississippian subperiod, 1100 to 1350 AD, large and powerful chiefdom centered towns and imposing mounds dominated the landscape. By far, the largest and most impressive chiefdom capital of this time was the Etowah site located in northwestern Georgia near Cartersville. Mississippian people were organized as chiefdoms or rank societies. Chiefdoms were a specific kind of human social organization with social ranking as a fundamental part of their structure. In rank societies, People belong to one of two groups, elites or commoners. Elites, who made up a relatively small percentage of chiefdom populations, had a higher social standing than commoners. This difference between elites and commoners rested more on ideological and religious beliefs than on such things as wealth or military power. They had larger houses and special clothing and food. They were exempt from many of life's hard labors like food production. The much more numerous commoners 
were the everyday producers of the society. They grew food, made crafts, and served as warriors and as laborers for public works projects. Their primary food source was referred to as the Three Sisters, corn, beans, and squash. The corn's tall, straight stalks were perfect for the climbing vines of the bean plants. In turn, the roots of the bean captured nitrogen from the air and enriched the soil, which is ideal for the corn, which needs nitrogen-rich soil to produce a large crop. The squash was planted in between the rows of corn and beans and acted as the edible ground cover, which not only kept the weeds away, but also provided shade for the corn's very shallow roots. The men were also engaged in providing meat for the chieftain, mainly fish, turkey, small game, and especially deer. Their expertise in hunting deer would eventually contribute to the chieftain's downfall and loss of their land. Along with their agricultural pursuits, some of these commoners, often led by a lesser elite, formed smaller surrounding towns that were established nearer their hunting and fishing sources. They created trails or paths which were used to remain connected with the mother city and other towns. The entrance of Hernando de Soto into Georgia in 1540 marks the beginning of what is termed the historical period of Georgia. It came at a time when the great ceremonial centers of the Middle and Late Mississippian period were declining and villages were scattered across the face of the state. In March of 1540, De Soto and his army had reached just inside the southern border of what is now Georgia, a few miles south of present-day Cairo. When they reached the Flint River, they built a crude boat and ferried everyone to the western side of the river. From there, they proceeded to the Chickasawhatchee Swamp, where they came to the chiefdom of Kappa Chiki, just west of today's Albany, Georgia. This map depicts the approximate locations of the historic Indian chiefdoms across South Georgia at the time of De Soto. It also depicts the numerous Indian settlements as they were distributed across the state. Note that there was a settlement located near the Mud Creek area of Berrien County. This is settlement was located near one of the main Indian routes crossing the southern section of the state. Two early Indian routes passed through what would become Marion County. They were known as Kennard's Trail and Kennard's Path. Kennard's Trail near Nashville was the primary trading route between St. Mary's on the seacoast and the Indian trading post on the Flint River, known as Kennards. It was operated in the mid to late 1700s by the Creek Indian chief, Jack Kennard, near today's Leesburg, about 16 miles from Cheha Park in Albany. Kennard's Path was a secondary trading route that took traders closer to Alapaha. The mound's proximity to the two trading routes suggests their locations may have been used by inhabitants from larger town sites on the Flint River while engaged in hunting and fishing expeditions. The infusion of European traders from the coast brought metal implements and colorful clothing to trade with the Indians for deerskins, 
which were very desirable by the white traders. This added pressure on the hunting grounds to keep up with the demand of deer skins eventually diminished the deer population. Smaller villages moved closer to the hunting grounds, which led to the elimination of the larger social structure of the chiefdoms. Mound building was reduced to the smaller, shallow burial sites throughout their hunting grounds. After 1820, settlers from North and South Carolina, Tennessee, and Middle Georgia homesteaded along and near these trails. This historical marker is located where U.S. Highways 82 and 221 intersect near Pearson, Georgia in Atkinson County. Now, let's fast forward in time to 1883 when Mr. Taylor authored his report on the mounds. What were the condition of the mounds and what burial remains and artifacts were located in the mounds? Most likely, nature had already reclaimed the area around the mound and even over the tops of the mounds, similar to this mound photo from an eastern Alabama site. Again, the Reedy Creek Mound, according to William J. Taylor, was located in Landlot 224 of the 5th District, 10 miles northeast of Alapaha, just across the northern border of Berrien County in Irwin County. In the 1908 Landlot map of Irwin County, the west boundary of Landlot 224 crossed Reedy Creek at Sutton Bridge. The old northeastern route of the Alapaha Osilla Road passed by the Spring Hill Church as it crossed into Irwin County, then on through Landlot 224. Note that the present-day route of U.S. Highway 129 joined up with the old Alapaha Osilla Road just north of Reedy Creek as shown with the red line. On this present-day map of Irwin County, the northeastern route of the old Alapaha Osilla Road is now called Tulip Road as it passes by Spring Hill Church and continues on through Landlot 224. Tulip Road meets the western boundary of Lot 224 as it crosses Althea Road. The old Alapaha Osilla Road turned north on Althea Road crossed Reedy Creek before veering left on Green Road, which, which meets Highway 129 north of Reedy Creek. Tulip Road is on the south side of Reedy Creek until the road meets Highway 129. Assuming the mound is located near the banks of Reedy Creek in Landlot 224, the property owners are as listed by the Irwin County Assessor's Office are the Crumley family and the Harper family farms on the north bank of the creek. On the south bank of the creek are the properties of the Mercer Mitchell Corporation and of Billy and LaDon Polk. The Reedy Creek Mound in 1883 was described by Mr. Taylor as being 48 feet at the base diameter and 6 feet high. There was a vault or dug hole 5 feet long, 3 feet wide, and 1 and a half feet deep in the center of the mound, in which the bodies were burnt and afterwards covered up. On top of this covering was a burnt mass 3 feet deep and 20 feet in diameter. The entire diameter was then burnt again and covered up. There were no relics of any type found in the mound. The second mound 
called the Alapaha Mound by Mr. Taylor, is north of Alapaha near the Alapaha River on landlot 328 of the 5th District, shown here on the 1908 county map. On today's map, landlot 328 is on the south side of Mount Perrin Church Road, east of U.S. Highway 129 and west of Mount Perrin Church. According to Jason Owen, who has visited what remains of the site, its location is in the northeast quarter of the landlot. Its property owners are members of the Tucker, Brogdon, and Purvis families. The mound in 1883 was 38 feet across, 6 feet above ground level, and somewhat oval in shape. In the center of the mound was a burial vault six feet deep, three feet wide, and six feet in length, positioned north and south. Two bodies were deposited in the vault with the heads pointing southward. From the appearance at the time of exploration, the bodies had been deposited in the vault and then covered with a large quantity of ashes and pine coals. The bones were very much decayed and no implements of any kind were found. Since the time of the report in 1883, the mound has been greatly disturbed, primarily by moonshiners that used the location to hide their operation in the 1950s. In the only image I have available of the site, the recent explorers in the upper third of the photo are standing on the edge of what remains of the mound. On the lower two thirds of the photo is the depression that was most likely dug out to hide the still operation. The third mound site, the Withlacoochee Mound, is situated five miles south of Nashville just west of Old Coffee Road, on Landlot 278 of the 10th District. This location is just north of my own great-grandfather, William Hess Griffin's farm, yet I never heard my grandmother speak of the nearby Indian mounds. On today's map, the easternmost boundary of Landlot 278 is located at the west end of Bennett Cemetery Road, adjacent to the Bennett Cemetery. The northwest corner of 278 almost touches with Lacucci Creek. Almost all of Landlot 278 is owned by Brenda Deloach and David Deloach. Yet, when I interviewed Brenda regarding the Indian mound on her property, she said she knew folks had found arrowheads on the property, but she had never heard there had been an Indian mound there. Other property owners in the land lot are Jerry Jager, Julius Sellis, and W.S. Perry. The Withlacoochee Mound was the smallest of the Berrien County mounds, 18 feet in diameter at the base, 3 feet high. Mr. Taylor indicated no relics were found, and even the bones were so far decayed that it was impossible to tell the mode of burial. It is possible this mound has so deteriorated over time it may be undistinguishable on the terrain or even plowed under with cultivation. Finally, the fourth mound of Berrien County is the Futch Ferry Mound. Mr. Taylor referred to it as the French Ferry Mound, most likely mistaking the name Futch for French. He located the mound as being in landlot 415 of the 10th District, 10 miles south of Nashville, 
seven miles southeast of Adel Post Office. It was located one mile downriver from the ferry crossing. Several years ago, the late Mr. K. Devane, who grew up nearby, told me he had been to the Indian Mound several times as a young boy. However, he said they were difficult to recognize due to their deteriorated condition. In 1883, Mr. Taylor indicated there were two mounds located in a red oak thicket on a hillside facing south. He stated that the earth for the structure was obtained 30 yards up the hillside. The work was built around a pine stump. One of the mounds was made of yellow sand mixed with gravel and rock. The other mound had a mass of charcoal mixed with earth. Size and scale of the mounds was not mentioned. No bones or relics were found. Though Landlot 415 was in Berrien County in 1883, very little of it is touched by the Withlacoochee River. The bluff from which the earth was taken is most likely on the west side of the river. This would put the mounds in today's Cook County. However, Mr. Taylor also states the hillside was facing south. The river runs mostly west to east in this section, which would put the south-facing mound on today's burying side of the river. Given that Mr. Taylor had erroneously placed the Reedy Creek Mound as being in Berrien County instead of its location in Irwin County, it is certainly possible that the placement of the Futch Ferry Mound is in an adjacent landlot to 415. Landlot 414 has a large southern exposure of the river bank. Also, the west side of Landlot 416 has a short but distinct southern exposure of the river bank. This section is owned by Philip Akins. I spoke to Philip about the possibility of mounds being located there, and he stated that he had never heard of it. If, in fact, the mounds are in Landlot 415, they most likely are in Cook County. The property owners that border the river on Landlot 415 are the Merwin family, the Marshall family, and the Fowler Henson families. In all likelihood, in 1883, these mounds were already in a state of deterioration and certainly were disturbed in the exploration by William J. Taylor. Over the subsequent 136 years, they have been continually explored, vandalized, and even used as a hideout for moonshine operators. The pioneer culture generally did not respect these sites as sacred burial grounds. However, the Indian trails and paths that crisscrossed Georgia became travel routes for white traders and prompted the infusion of the European culture into central Georgia. Today, Highway 82 follows almost the exact route of Kennard's path between Albany and Waycross. We must take a moment to reflect in amazement when we occupy and go about our lives in a country that was traveled by Indian tribes three or four hundred years ago. Now let me emphasize, these mounds, if they even still exist, are all on private property. Most of these landowners do not want the mound sites disturbed, and most don't even want to be disturbed themselves by curiosity seekers. Laws passed in 1992 made it illegal to dig, disturb, or harm an archaeological site without the written permission of the landowner. 
Even with the permission of the landowner, the Department of Natural Resources must be notified before any exploration begins. In closing, I hope this brief presentation by the Barian Historical Foundation was informative and helpful in your understanding of the indigenous people who hunted, fished, traveled through, and even resided in this land we now call Berrien County.